All right, so I've been holding off on this video for a pretty long time, but today I'm gonna to show you my investment portfolio. I'm gonna break down where I keep my assets, what I invest my money into. I was very hesitant to actually create this video and for one reason, and that's because I was afraid that people would see what I'm doing and potentially try to mimic what I'm doing or think that because Nate is investing this way that I should invest that way as well. Uh, and I just wanna make it very clear that first of all, I'm not a professional investor. I'm obviously not a financial advisor, uh, but look, simply because I have 400,000 subscribers on this YouTube channel doesn't mean that I'm any better of an investor than anyone else. Uh, and to be truthful, for the entire time that I've been investing, we've been in a bull market. So sure, I have seen some pretty decent gains over the past years, but so has everyone else. So I just wanna make that very clear that uh, what I'm doing here, I don't want you to mimic this. I just wanted to share with you uh, what it is that I'm doing because I've had so many people ask about this. So let's get into this video and let's talk about uh, what it is that I'm investing into. But once again, I'll probably say this 50 times in this video, but I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just some random ass person on the internet. So let's get started here. Let's talk about the, the biggest allocation here uh, within my investments, within my assets. Uh, and that is what you might have already guessed. You might uh, not be surprised by this, uh, but it's a very simple S&P 500 index. Okay, so something like this, uh, look, uh, I've talked about it quite a bit in the past on this channel, but what I like about it is, first of all, it diversifies pretty well for my portfolio. So there's hundreds of stocks that are in this index fund. Uh, it's an ETF. Uh, one of the tickers for it, if, if you're looking for something like this, would be something like VOO. This, this is a VOO for the Vanguard index. But most different uh, financial institutions have some version of this. So I know that there's a Schwab one, there's a T. Rowe Price one, uh, there's a Fidelity S&P 500 index fund. Uh, but what's what I like about this is, first of all, it has a very low expense ratio. So most of them are going to be well below a tenth of a percent for an expense ratio. That is the biggest allocation there. It comes in at about 31%. Now, look, throughout this video as well, I want to make it very clear that there might be a point or, or something that I say that you don't necessarily agree with, that you say, you know, Nate, you will have too much of that stock or you have too much in that fund. You're not balanced in this area. You should have more foreign companies. You should own more bonds. Hey, look, Everybody has different levels of risk that they're willing to take. Everybody has different goals, different retirement dates. Uh, and so just keep that in mind that uh, we all have different ideas of, 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 of where we want to be in the future uh, and what we're looking for. So there's no one correct por portfolio for anyone, but this is something that I'm happy with how I've allocated this at the moment. Um, so if you have a difference there or if you have a different strategy, Feel free to share it down below, very interested. Also, you might as well subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Uh, and let's talk about the next sort of area here. And I know people are going to certainly disagree with this one, uh, but I'm, I'm very strong on this one in, in a sense that I'm likely going to keep this level of, of, of assets in this category. And that is simply having cash on hand. I, I think it's incredibly important to have enough cash on hand for two reasons. I'm gonna give you two reasons here. So I have about 28% of my overall assets in cash. Now, not just sitting in a bank account that's netting no returns whatsoever. It's netting, well, right now, about 1.7%. So it's essentially inflation protected, you could think of it, although the Fed just cut interest rates yesterday, so it's probably gonna go down even more. But I like having quite a bit of cash on hand for two reasons. One of them uh, being that I found that uh, I have been focused more so on investing into, we could say, my own ventures, uh, investing into my own business ventures, uh, rather than kind of throwing money into other businesses like Facebook or investing into other companies. I wanted to kind of reinvest back into myself and reinvest back into my own ventures so that if I want some startup capital, if I want 10, 20, $30,000 to pump into some new business venture because maybe I don't have enough time for it, but I think there's a really great opportunity, I can do so because I have enough cash on hand to do that. So that's why about 28% of my portfolio is made up of cash. There's a common saying that savers are losers. Uh, obviously there's some truth to that over time, what we've seen in the past, um, but I, I still do like having quite a bit of cash on hand. Obviously it, it does create stability as well. Uh, having the inflation protected account, a money market account, money market fund, a lot of those will hopefully protect against inflation. Usually inflation and interest rates are somewhat correlated, so we'll see how that goes in the future. But I am also considering uh, buying some real estate properties. And so I just wanted to make sure that I have enough cash on hand uh, so that if I see a deal, uh, obviously I don't have any real estate at the moment. I'm 21, so I haven't gotten into it yet. 
uh, but I want that ability to do that soon. Uh, and so that's what I appreciate about that. So I will leave a link down below. I'm, I might as well just plug this here uh, for CIT Bank. I don't know what their interest rate is going to be in the future. I know right now it's 1.7%. It's one of the best on the market. So I'll, I'll leave a link down below if you are looking to open a high interest savings account uh, down in the description. And that is an affiliate link. I might get like a little bit of money every time somebody signs up for that bank account, but it helps support the channel. Uh, and let's move on to the next one here, which makes up about 27% of my portfolio. Uh, and that is going to be individual stocks. Now we'll talk about these individual companies in the coming minutes here. Uh, but this is something that I'm really actually looking to get down further closer to maybe I would say about 18%, about 15 to 18% of my portfolio. Right now it's a little bit heavy into individual stocks. I'm going to explain that why I'm kind of veering away from those slightly. And once again, this is just my, my preference that I'm doing this for. Uh, one of those reasons is because, as I said earlier, I want to focus on investing into my own ventures rather than uh, kind of thinking about investing into companies where I have less control over those situations. Now, I don't want to be a control freak, and I know that there's a lot of fluctuations within the markets, but for example, there's a lot less that you can see coming uh, with, with big corporations uh, that you could have potentially otherwise uh, held off on uh, if, if you were running it as your own business. So I'll give, <coughs> so I'll give you guys an example here. Uh, I had money in Facebook uh, about, I think it was a year and a half ago now, back in the summer, uh, and it was doing well, stock prices up to $220 a share, I was riding it up, and then suddenly Cambridge Analytica scandal happens, stock drops to $150, lose $70 a share. It came back after that, took a while to come back, but the point here is that there's certain things, that it's difficult to see it coming. It, uh, if you invested into Papa John's a couple years ago, you wouldn't be doing so great today because of what happened with the CEO, right? So there's certain things that I don't like about investing in individual stocks. That doesn't mean that I don't invest in them. Obviously, like I said, I have 27% of my portfolio spread out among a number of different individual stocks. And as I said earlier in this video, I was pretty hesitant to make this video because uh, I don't want people to, to simply buy stocks that I personally have in my portfolio because they trust my opinion and they think that I'm, I'm correct, so therefore they're going to buy them. But I will just briefly share a couple of the largest holdings in those individual stocks. Uh, first of all, Facebook is something that I've had for quite a while. I've been selling those off. If you watched last month's video, I mentioned that. Uh, PayPal is something that I've been bullish on for a very long time. One of the first stocks that I've talked about on this channel when I started it three years ago, it's been doing quite well. Uh, Microsoft, Alphabet, Netflix. Uh, I don't have any Tesla stock at the moment. Uh, do I regret not buying it when it was at $200 a share? Perhaps, but it's, it's easy to look back on something and, and say, wow, I should have bought that at that price. Uh, but it's, it's, it's much more difficult to do that in the future. So, uh, but I also have a number of dividend stocks as well, ones that I've held for uh, as, as long as I can remember uh, when I've been investing. So uh, PPL, Cedar Fair, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, uh, a lot of these companies that are what, what, what would be regarded as blue chip stocks or dividend stocks. What I like about this, what's, what's a, a positive about this is that most of these what we call blue chip stocks are seen as relatively safe companies. Unless you're investing into craft or in, unless you're investing into a couple of other ones in this blue chip category that might not be doing so hot right now, um, you know, for the most part, they are seen as dividend stocks, companies that have been around for a long time uh, that will hopefully continue to have slow but steady growth uh, in the coming years as well. So uh, I like to mix up dividend stocks with my what we could call growth stocks. I have some that are a little bit more speculative. For example, Snap uh, or uh, Penn National Gaming, P-E-N-N -N is the ticker for that. They're very highly leveraged, have a lot of debt kind of concerning, but uh, I bought them for really the primary reason, the fact that they bought a minority stake in Barstool Sports valued at $450 million, which I think is incredibly low, and they're gonna have a, the rights to uh, have the majority stake uh, in the coming months here as well, which I think was a very, very smart move. And it's something that, you know, personally, I wanted to invest into it. I want to take a very small percentage of my income, uh, of my assets, and put it into some of these, what we could say, more speculative investments, uh, including Snap as well. So Snapchat, a lot of people forgot about Snapchat, uh, but I don't believe it's a zero-sum game. I don't believe they're going to become the MySpace of today, but more so that there is room for more players in the social media uh, area at the moment. So look at Twitter, for example. A lot of people started to write off Twitter uh, in the past couple of years. They thought, you know, Twitter is going to be phased out. People aren't going to want to do uh, uh, typing anymore. They're just going to be posting pictures on Instagram or on YouTube. Uh, but I think Twitter has proven that there is certainly a place in the market 
for Twitter uh, for a very long period of time. And I, I think that's true for Snap as well. Uh, so those are some of the more speculative plays we could say. Don't like to put too much money into the ones that we could say are riskier or the companies that are uh, more highly leveraged. Obviously, there's more room for growth, but there's also a lot more room for error there. So those are my individual stocks. Now, there's a couple more to make up to 100% of my investment portfolio or, or where my assets are at the moment. Uh, one of them being just the, the a total bond market ETF. I believe the ticker is BND for that. Uh, makes up about 8% of my portfolio. Now, people might say, Nate, you're not diversified enough. What are you doing? Uh, where are your international stocks? Where's your international companies, your bonds? Uh, and this is just the allocation that I have at the moment. I'm likely going to uh, become more international in the coming months. I, I want to get back into that. I kind of weaned off some of those in the past. I wasn't seeing great performance on them. Uh, but so bonds, Contrary to what many people believe, especially beginners believe, they think that, that uh, you can't lose money in bonds. That's certainly not true. And we can see bonds uh, get into pretty sticky situations, especially uh, if we see default rates going up for companies or for municipalities and governments. Uh, for example, if you uh, were giving money to Puerto Rico uh, quite a while back and you gave them bonds, uh, you would have not gotten your money back in most cases because they defaulted on a lot of those loans. So uh, bonds are not totally risk-free. Just keep that in mind. They are generally, by most people, seen as safer than stocks, uh, but there still is risk involved with that. Um, so I know I'm probably a little bit light on the bonds, but because I'm pretty heavy on the cash, uh, it's, it's something that I'm willing to do to make up for that so that I'm, I'm still uh, quite, quite uh, uh, safe in the perspective that a good portion of my portfolio, when you factor in uh, bonds, cash, and some of these, these very blue chip stocks, ones that are seen as very safe companies, uh, makes up about half or more of my portfolio total. Uh, and so the last final one to make up the 6%, we're gonna bundle a couple in here uh, just to make up that final percentage there. Uh, and that is going to be precious metals, uh, cryptocurrency, and collectibles. So this is kind of just a, a, a kind of wide basket of different things that I have. Uh, most of these, I don't want to say that they're an afterthought because I certainly do like to invest a couple percent of my assets into precious metals. For example, gold, while it may be somewhat risky, it's something that has held value for longer than any company in history. It's held value for tens of thousands of years in human history. So I like to just have a little bit, not a lot, because it is very difficult to predict the prices of gold in the future. Crypto as well, crypto is much more speculative, we could say, um, but then I also have some collectibles as well. And the collectible area is just something that I enjoy doing, uh, not so much I'm focused on the return on investment, but just kind of a place to store assets so you know at some point in the future maybe i'll get a nice watch and a good portion of that could be kind of factored into that as well but that makes up the total 100 percent a lot of you guys have been asking what am i doing with with the coronavirus with uh, potential recession potential market crashes uh and i think i've been very clear about this i didn't think i had to make an entire video on it uh, but i'm going to be holding for the long term i'm not going to be tapping into my investments for hopefully 10 20 30 or 40 years down the road so i'm not quite worried about something that might happen uh, in the next couple of weeks i'm keeping my mind in the, the long run so thanks for watching the video appreciate all the support if you think of something differently and and you you uh put your assets into different areas feel free to share them my portfolio is quite simple uh this is the most of it um, but thanks for watching appreciate all the support and i'll see everybody in next week's video